So we have the panel titled Collective Memories, Romani Testimony Archives with three distinguished speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Adia Nicola Fortuna from the Research Institute for Quality of Life from the Romanian Academy. And without further ado, I would invite you to give your lecture, please. Thank you. I'm Adrian to collect Kunal. I want to uh, tell you that I start to collect uh, uh, testimonies with the Roma survivors of the deportation to Transnistria since 2009, I think. <laughs> and uh, today I uh, want to share with you uh, one of the things, observations, I would say, uh, that I uh, made on the, on the field. Uh, and I was uh, attracted by the idea that uh, during the interviews, a part of the of the survivors were uh, mentioning also some uh, Russian uh, words uh, in their uh, testimonies. Uh, in fact, uh, they were uh, referring to the uh, to some words from the Ukrainian uh, language because you know that the Roma people were deported. Uh, in uh, Transnistria, a place for, occupied uh, by the Romanian and German army in the Ukraine. So, uh, but before this, because. Oh, no, not now. No. Okay. <coughs> no, it, it, it was my fault. Okay. It, it's okay. And uh, next slide, maybe. Yeah. I think the uh, yeah, maybe the keyboard is not huh? yeah. Okay, but before this, because uh, we are speaking also uh, uh, in general about the uh, voice of the Roma, uh, I want to uh, share with you uh, this uh, collection of uh, of letters uh, written uh, by the Roma soldiers whose families were deported to Transnistria. So this collection uh, contains uh, 100 uh, letters uh, sent by the Roma soldiers whose families were deported. And also, uh, uh, this book is translated also in, uh, in English. And uh, from my point of view, uh, seeing on these uh, archive documents, uh, it was clear that even if they were uh, written by Roma, uh, they were uh, very much uh, influenced uh, by the ideology of the time. So one of the questions that comes into my mind is in what measure uh, really represent the voice of the Roma, these uh, documents, because uh, being soldiers uh, and uh, addressing this question to uh, Ioan Antonescu, that was the uh, uh, the dictator and the, the, the leading person of, of Romania at that time, uh, it's uh, sometimes they uh, uh, address very humble and uh, uh, they give them, uh, give him honor and so on. So uh, this I wanted to also to share with you from my experience with archive documents. I'm not a historian, I'm a sociologist. Uh, but now I want to share with you uh, some, uh, some uh, parts of interviews in which some Russian uh, words are uh, uh, mentioned by the survivors. So, first example is from uh, 
Radu Alexandrina, Roma Survivor. Uh, and uh, the interview was uh, made in Romani language, but the translation is uh, phonetic, I would say. It's not the standard uh, translation in uh, Romani language. And uh, you can see that uh, she is uh, uh, remembering a moment when uh, her mother was uh, had some interaction with uh, the Russian uh, woman and asking for some for some potatoes. Dati mi ha I went penga penga like a very and uh, uh, the Russian lady uh, asked uh, Berlin that uh, uh, she was saying that means uh, <coughs> take. <coughs> Another example is uh, from uh, Maria Caldera, uh, from an interview that I collected in 2017. And uh, here uh, it's mentioned the the bread uh, and uh, also we have like the same issue of uh, of the food. I have only few interviews in this presentation. I will look for more if I write a paper about this. Uh, and. Uh, This is the translation in English. It was desert there, the Russian woman <coughs> were home alone without their husbands. They were all fighting on the battlefield. And when we asked them for a little polenta, nema chleba, nema. Uh, and that's why they call polenta. It was, in fact, uh, uh, the bread. Uh, and it's interesting that she said, I forgot what they call polenta. I forgot the word. It's been so long. I was 30 years old then. At the collective farm, I had to dig up potatoes and sunflowers. So it's interesting because she's like uh, trying to remember the, the words that the Russians were uh, using. So now I would like to, to put the video on, if it's possible. I have also a short video. Should I start? Um, you can start? Yes, yes, it's in, it's in Romani, but <laughs> at the moment it will be uh, something in Ukrainian, Russian. now. Oh, it's like old food, mangasta. I need to know such a mangasta hat. Then, mak, mak, mak. Shoot it, hot. Oh, do my Latin and Kurti. And the Shavik and Kilabanas and Akordonos. Which a die, Daddy. Shday Bani. Shukunti Latin. So she, she saying. At the beginning, the interview is in, in Romani, and she's saying that uh, we didn't know how to ask them for food in their language. And uh, we are saying, we want one uh, mark mark. And uh, after that, she's uh, 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 remembering how the Russians were uh, answering. Uh, I think it's something like, what do you want? The, the answer. So I will come back to the presentation. This is so. <coughs> um, I found here I have only three interviews with such uh, uh, mentions, but in the interviews that I made during the years, I think that I have like 10 uh, such uh, examples, maybe interview, in the interviews made by others, 
uh, maybe uh, there are also uh, this type of uh, examples. Uh, and uh, I find it interesting because I think that, that they are in fact uh, mnemonics that are related with the uh, traumatic past. Uh, and also it's interesting because they are coming uh, from the language of the other in order to recall their own past. And uh, also uh, I think that they are like a, a retelling uh, of the of the events. Uh, another thing related with uh, Russian words, I would say that it's the fact that the Roma survivors um, often they make <coughs> reference uh, not only to daily uh, sufferance in, uh, in Transnistria. Uh, they relate their uh, 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 sufferance with the, the sufferance of the others, and especially of the Russians. Uh, for example, in, this is a song that I collected in 2012, if I remember well. Uh, and uh, here is the translation. And here you can see, but you should see the Russian woman, how they cry after their houses. So this is because the part of the Roma that were deported to Transnistria uh, were put um, in the houses that <clears throat> were belonging, in fact, to the uh, local population, uh, Ukrainians. They were taken away from their houses and uh, in those houses were put like four or five families uh, of Roma. Uh, and I, uh, I, find, I find it uh, interesting in the field of memory because uh, Roma also refer, uh, refer to the other when, uh, when they uh, speak about uh, their uh, uh, persecution. Uh, it is a uh, for me, uh, a challenge in, uh, in order to um, address uh, better uh, the emotions and the way in, in which uh, the Roma deported to Transnistria conserved uh, their memory uh, during the time. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, uh, type of uh, mnemonics, I mean, the interviews uh, were made uh, after a long time. Uh, I think that uh, if the interviews uh, were made uh, probably immediately after the uh, deportation, uh, we, have, we would have the opportunity to find uh, uh, more uh, 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 mnemonics uh, in the language. Uh, and uh, also, I think that this type of uh, mnemonics uh, reflects on the relation, on the human relations between the, the Roma deportees and the uh, locals uh, from uh, uh, Transnistria. And it's, uh, it's very interesting for me because the survivors, after uh, more than uh, uh, seven decades, they recall uh, these, uh, these words in, uh, in their memory and they try to make efforts in order to uh, uh, remember. So uh, this was my... Uh, uh, it is a, also a challenge for me because I'm not a linguist, I'm not a psychologist, but I found this uh, very uh, interesting uh, on the field. And uh, 
I wanted to uh, to share it with you and maybe to uh, put it uh, forward on a paper. Thank you. Introduce our next speaker, who is Joey Rauschenberg from the Anti Gypsyism Research Center and also Heidelberg University. Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, um, Martin, and uh, to everyone involved in this smooth organization. In the early days of the Federal Republic of Germany, the program of compensation for the victims of National Socialism soon developed into an administrative branch of its own with widely ramified structures. While compensation was initially still locally rooted and consequently characterized by direct contact with known people, it soon became more anonymous and therefore alienated from its own target group. At the end of the bureaucratization process, um, compensation was primarily an abstract administrative act, which made the practices of decision-making um, appear opaque and, according to historian Heiko Scharfenberg, often led to a feeling of powerlessness among former victims, which could result in apathetic acceptance of rejection notes. For a history of compensation for city and Roma survivors that is yet to be written, it will be essential to consider the bureaucratization of compensation as one factor that helped um, generate a practice characterized overall by obstacles, wrong decisions, and deficits. Yet in this presentation, the perspective, which in the tradition of classical anti-Ziganism research is generally oriented toward the perceptions and actions of the majority society and its institutions, will be turned around and the powerlessness thesis and um, established in historical scholarship will be critically examined. And therefore the actions and forms of self-determination of the Sinti and Roma will be looked at. A priori, it sounds plausible that the described development towards the alienation of compensation bureaucracy from its own clientele had a detrimental effect, especially for Sinti and Roma, as they were largely marginalized in society, <coughs> did not have pro uh, professional interest representation as existed for other victim groups, groups, and therefore had hardly any possibilities to step out of the thicket of administration procedures to make themselves visible as individuals. Nonetheless, in the um, individual case files of the state offices for compensation, Numerous examples exist of members of the minority creating small niches of agency in the rigid system of bureaucratism. Sinti and Roma make their voices heard through petitions, applications, demands, and accusations of all kinds. In the following, such documents of courageous self empowerment <coughs> and self assertion in a fundamentally asymmetrical power relationship between single applicants and officials entrusted with state authority are presented. There I upon, I will show some existing opportunities for Roma applicants <coughs> to organize external support to improve their chances for compensation payments. Thereby, I will also point out the difficulties and ambivalences of these sometimes feigned allies. As one important way of this coalition building, some considerations on the role of the lawyers of Sinti and Roma will be made, which has, as far as I see, not yet been done. The few selected examples for this presentation all come from the German Southwest, more precisely from the files of the state compensation offices in Freiburg, Karlsruhe, and Tübingen, which I evaluated uh, as part of my dissertation project on compensation for Sinti and Roma after 1945 in Baden-Württemberg. 
Out of an emotional state between despair and the courage of despair, the Sinto Bernhard Heinrich Pisserer created, you see here, created something like the prototype of such letters of complaint. Even before his responsible compensation office had decided on Pisserer's application, he resorted to the ultimate threat of wanting to take his own life if he did not receive help. I am, he continued, already being pulled around by the nose for four years and so far to no avail. No one can understand what a bitter life I, le I lived, which I am not used to. After the application was rejected in late 1950 because of the <coughs> assumption that the persecution was not carried out for racial reasons, Pisler once again protested vigorously against his treatment. He complained that his statements have been questioned as laughable, but he will show, quote, that I have spoken the truth to you, the truth as it was. Finally, he went uh, on to make a general accusation against what he saw as an aloof bureaucratic class. Quote, you take it so easy when a person has lost his health, <coughs> suffered under hard labor for five and a half years because you are a gypsy. We are not mass murderers like the Hitlerian party. We fight for truth and justice. With this, Pistola even implied a proximity between the staff of the compensation office and the National Socialist persecutors. This common front of German state representatives before and after 1945, characterized by continuity, was opposed by what Pistola conceived as we, the persecuted, surviving, and now again discriminated Oma, whose fight for truth and justice, thus for reappraisal, recognition, and compensation, he invoked. Indeed, this fight was taking place. Many Sinti and Oma drew attention to themselves through repeated inquiries and urged that their cases be processed more quickly. Some remained emphatically polite or imitated the pale officialese of their correspondence partners. This represents, so to speak, the standard case of Omani's self-efficiency in the context of compensation proceedings. Others, like Elvira Bühler, whose son had been uh, executed by Wehrmacht and SS officers, were more taunting. She bluntly expressed the pride and outlined the problems that arose from extraordinary, extraordinarily long processing times. Quote, I have submitted the papers properly and yet I am only put off from one month to the next. I am now old and sick and without income. I need the money now for my last years. If I have to bite the dust, then I don't need it anymore. This is obviously translated for those of you who can read German. It's uh, the presentation. The opposite of a more restrained strategy was chosen by those as well who threatened the officials to appeal to higher authorities. This threat was not uncommon among the Sinti and Roma, and occasionally it was carried out. In November 1960, Arthur Tollmann received mail from the Ministry of Justice of Baden-Württemberg, to which a previous letter from Tollmann to the Federal Chancellery had been forwarded. Tollmann's initiative led to nothing more than the Ministry of Justice repeated the negative report of the, the subordinate compensation office. But the process does mark a remarkable self-confidence. After all, Trollmann was an Auschwitz survivor who, 15 years after his liberation, had not received any recognition as a persecutor of National Socialism, <coughs> but who instead had received three prison sentences for minor offenses in that same time span. He would have had every reason to lose faith in the capability of a German state exercising justice. Still, Trollmann did not despair and continued to hope that the letter to Adenauer's office might uh, solve his problem. And, as if that were not enough, eight years later he addressed Chancellor Kiesinger with the same request. See on the right. Another interesting example is provided by Rosa Winter as she showed admirable endurance in the face of the slow, grinding mills of administration. Between 1957 and 1977, she repeatedly made personal contact with the Compensation Office. Even when, in the mid-1970s, a rethinking took place and the office informed Winter 
that it was finally ready to pay out the lump sum of 6,000 DMARC. The Simtetsa was unable to switch from the fighting mode that had been forced upon her, and by now became a habit. By then, she probably expected only bad things from the authorities that, be, that had been uh, stalling, discriminating, and disappointing her for decades. Even now, sensing in the granting of the maximum possible amount only another move of the authority to her disadvantage, she declared that she did, quote, not agree that I am only entitled to 6,000 DMARC for all that time. Beyond the legal point of view, a position that is certainly morally convincing. Winter, like the aforementioned Elvira Bühler, must have had help with her correspondence with the authorities, because both stated that they were unable to read and write because of the persecution that occurred during their school years. Beyond widespread writing assistance by family, friends or acquaintances, there were other opportunities for Roma to get their claims supported. To substantiate the damage to education, one synthesizer countered the anti ziganist authority's skepticism about the basic proficiency for academic success by having the former teacher assure that she once had been a promising student. Others mobilized former employers who vouched for their upright character to prove that the applicant's detention had to be the result of racial policies. In the case of several synthesizers, Fathers or husbands appeared in the office, in the offices, insisting on payments. Especially in these cases, cases it is often unclear and impossible to decide from the sources whether the interests of the men coincided with those of the daughters and wife, wives for whom they spoke. Especially when the assignment of claims to male relatives was, was declared, there is possibility that these females, on top of their situation, had to contend with patriarchal family structures. Paternalistic tendencies uh, among supposed or actual advocates of the Sinti and Roma can still be observed much later. The Civil Society Welfare Association, Nachbarschaftswerk Freiburg e.V., in 1975, asked the Compensation Office, which had recently awarded the Sinto Albert Wagner a sum of 12,000 EMAG, to quote, examine whether the amount could be paid to him on a monthly pension basis. This way, they told, the money could be used, quote, for the longer-term improvement of his living conditions. However, the client should be explicitly bypassed in this process. We ask, however, not to mention that this proposal comes from us, as otherwise our good relationship with Mr. Wagner would be jeopardized. A similar problem exists with the most important and widespread strategy for coalition building in the struggle for compensation, <coughs> the engagement of lawyers. In principle, it should be noted that, as first evaluations point out, the professional services of a lawyer were a big advantage. Nevertheless, a closer look at the individual cases reveals that the lawyer's work has not always been as beneficial as one might think. The spectrum ranged from dedicated fighters for the just cause of their clients to representatives who seemed to believe that they could earn an easy mark on the clueless Sinti and Roma and only had to do the most necessary work in return. Especially after the so-called uh, Federal Compensation Act, Final Act, 1966, and the resulting improvements for survivors of the Roma minority, numerous previously rejected applications were refiled. The compensation officers, in consequence, were overwhelmed with the mass of work, and in this situation, many lawyers now try to speed things, up, speed things up for their clients by pestering the officials with permanent letters. In 1966-67, the Cologne law practice Dr. Stoffel Dr. Lass urged almost monthly in trying to get the compensation office to decide on Maria Reinhardt's case. Partly indignant formulations like it is incomprehensible to us that no decision has yet been made, suggest that these lawyers were ready to attract trouble to achieve the best for the Roma they, advocate, they advocated. Surely, a busy lawyer could bring about concrete improvements for their clients. This can be seen in a number of individual cases in which lawyers who became involved recognized earlier made settlements as unfavorable 
and extracted a higher sum by challenging them. Many a lawyer has also overshot the mark with the best of intentions. A lawyer from the aforementioned Cologne office, who could not be identified by name, is said to have influenced a distant relative of his client who had been called uh, to court as, as a witness. The lawyer, so the witness, had asked him in a preparing talk suggestively whether, quote, I had not been mistaken in my earlier statement and had held out the prospect that I would then also have a chance with his own proceeding. Beyond personal consequences for the lawyer, which are unknown to me, it can be stated that the legal counsel has done a disservice to his client with the clumsy witness tampering that was exposed in court. While here the intention might have been good, lawyers for Sinti and Roma played a questionable role in other cases. In 1966, under the new provisions of the, uh, the, the final act, the lawyer Fitz H. Point from Karlsruhe wanted to challenge a court settlement of 1963, which had saved his client only a small amount of money and demanded a higher sum. For this, however, he did not more than writing a letter with the content, quote, I hereby register claims under the BED Final Act. In contrast to the examples of permanently annoying lawyers giving earlier, it was not until five years later and after the deadline for new applications under the BED Final Act had long since expired, that he thought to ask for the status of the claims. He then was instructed by the Composition Office in 1971 that such an unspecific letter could not be seen as a proper challenge um, to a settlement, which, so the conspicuously sharp remark, you as a lawyer will also have been aware of. So the claim damage of Emil Reinhardt could not be compensated with the demanded 7,500 mark, and only one and a half years later the needy applicant was at least granted 2,500 mark <coughs> from funds of the hardship case. Such mistakes are all the more dramatic when one considers that for Sinti and Roma, who often lived on the breadline as a late consequence of their um, persecution, hiring a lawyer could have been a risky investment. A letter written by Maria Kobi, which you see here in different stages of age, um, in 1971 to the Compensation Office reminds us of this. In this letter, she explains um, why she turned to the authorities personally instead of her former legal representative. Quote, unfortunately, I was not quite in a position to continue financing the matter because I needed the money for my children and to live again. And you will probably know yourself what a lawyer demands in the long run. Kobi herself had no luck either when she, despite the high costs, afforded another lawyer a short time later. After the Ravensburg lawyer Peter Graf P. Point had presented a power of attorney and simply asked to take Kobe's letter as an application for hardship funds, the compensation office informed him that his, quote, way of working now astonishes us somewhat. Contrary to the guidelines, the lawyer has waived the submission of all the necessary certificates and evidence. The somewhat odd constellation here seemed to be almost the reverse of the usual picture. Instead of the lawyer soliciting empathy for an applicant, here, in contrary, the office was concerned about the applicant's disadvantage by a defaulting lawyer. But even against such adversities of unprofessional legal representatives, and with that I come to conclusion, Sinti and Roma mustered the courage and strength to take action. Anita Wagner, for example, also faced the fate of an unmotivated lawyer. Unlike Kobi, however, who had initially just waited on her lawyer, Wagner actively pushed and caused him to take action. In June 1968, he asked the compensation office in a plaintive tone for information on, quote, when a decision can be expected so that I can inform the applicant in response to her constant inquiries. Maria Kobi, in turn, after all her bad experiences with the legal profession, tried on her own to achieve improvements for herself later. Her last attempt to obtain further compensation for physical damage in 1986 failed 
because she was already receiving the same benefits from hardship funds that she would have been entitled to if she had filed an application in due time in the legal procedure. Despite the hopelessness of her case, which even the Central Council of German City and Roma recognized, Kobe can be credited with having a sense for the inappropriate German uh, official terminology when she uttered her irritation by the term aid. Quote, you always speak of aiding and abetting. Why? I hereby apply once again for compensation for bodily injury and damage to health, as well as a pension, not aid. By law, it will have been correct to speak of an aid because Kobe's pension was <coughs> granted as a gesture of goodwill in the supra-legal procedure. Still, for those affected, it was disastrous because it made them feel patronized. Kobe didn't accept the message, though, that she had to be thankful. <clears throat> for receiving some charity. Instead, she insisted on the compensation to which she was legally entitled as a Nazi persecutor. At that time, however, in the mid 1980s, a completely new chapter began in the history of the self assertion of Sinti and Roma towards the German majority society. With the founding and increasing influence of the Central Council and the civil rights movement in general, minority members no longer stood up primarily uh, for their individual, but now for their collective concerns and rights. The presentation drew attention to the fact that this breakthrough to Roma empowerment in Germany has a prehistory that goes back at least to the early post-war period. Further examinations will have to focus on the concrete impact of these so far unheard Romani voices and the triangle between Roma Holocaust survivors, their multiple advocates and compensation officers in the course of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joy. Um, so without further ado, I would invite Mila Van Pisari to, to give her lecture, who is from the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory at the University of Belgrade. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm aware that I have a really difficult task because now is the third lecture of the after lunch session. So I promise you that it will be it will be brief. I will be clear. So please give me your attention to the following uh, for the following twenty minutes, and then we, we can have a coffee, double coffee, and continue the discussion. Okay, my my lecture is is about the. Uh, the testimonies of Roma survivors from uh, Yugoslav and Serbian archives. Uh, I immediately have to clarify why Serbian and Yugoslav, because, um, because uh, uh, there are some archives in Serbia, in Belgrade mainly, that uh, basically preserve the documentation of the former Yugoslavia, for example, the archive of Yugoslavia. So uh, it is, it, it, this is an archive in Serbia, but it's called the archive of, of Yugoslavia. Uh, a little bit, a little bit of, of history. Of course, I'm a historian. I'm proud to be a historian, of course. <laughs> 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 Even though I work at the Institute of Philosophy and Social Theory, and um, so I have to give you some inputs of the uh, about history, about the context. This is, this is not uh, a boring uh, history lesson. Uh, in German occupied Serbia, I'm talking about German occupied Serbia. Where in April 41, the, uh, the anti Roma regulations were introduced in already in April, April and, and, uh, and May. The same regulation was uh, uh, existed for the Jews and Roma, but from July 44, the anti Roma regulation uh, uh, has to be applied only to the so called nomads. This was a decision from, made by the, uh, by the German authorities. In the period from September to November 41, there is a period of the detention of the male Roma and, uh, and the mass shooting. So basically the Roma uh, from Belgium, male Roma from Belgium and other cities were uh, arrested and, and killed in mass shootings, mass retaliations. And in December, we have the period of the deportation of women and children from Belgium to the Simons to the concentration camp. Finally, we have this, the, 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 the period from 42 to 44, we have uh, uh, other mass shooting documented, we have forced labor for Roma, and we have other kind of retaliations basically from the Chetan units, uh, nationalists. 
uh, against the law. Unfortunately, this period is not researched in, in, enough still in, in historiography. When we talk about the archives, uh, we have to uh, uh, talk about the local archives. I think that we need to talk about local archives that basically are the archives of the main cities like Belgrade, Nish, uh, Khrushchev, and so on. Then we have to talk about the state archive, like the archive of Yugoslavia and the state, the military archive of the Republic of Serbia. We have in these local archives, we can find different documents, different documents. For example, testimonies from the war periods. Uh, and testimonies collected by the local subcommissions of the Yugoslav Reparation Commission. Daniel already mentioned something similar this morning. Uh, after the end of the war, the, Yugo, the Yugoslav, uh, Yugoslavia, the Yugoslav, new, Yugoslav state, they formed post special commissions for, uh, for the reparation, uh, basically. And they collected different testimonies from uh, every city, from every village about the, basically the, 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 what happened in, in, in that place. This is an example of the, of the uh, uh, document from a local archive. This is a, um, uh, a request made from, by, the, by a, um, a male Roma from Belgrade. And basically he says, I'm, uh, I, worked, uh, I was working here for the uh, municipality of Belgrade from uh, uh, 1928, and then I was expelled in 1941 in May uh, uh, due to the anti-Roma regulation. But then, starting from July, uh, I, was, uh, my name, I, I was not considered anymore as a Roma, so I'm asking to be uh, readmitted, to, be, to, to, to start working again. And we have different uh, kind of, 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 of these testimonies. Um, his signature is Bozhdar Stojanovic from, from Belgrade. This is the second, in my opinion, most um, um, important uh, kind of documents. This is uh, one of the reports of the, uh, 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 I mean, of the documents collected by the, this subcommission for, the, for reparation. What we can see, what we can read here. First of all, we can see that uh, the title let's say, is a report about, about the killing uh, of the disappearing of, of a person. The second important data information we have is that is the, the person who is giving uh, this, uh, this information. In this case, is, uh, uh, um, is a, a woman, um, uh, Stana Matkovic. Uh, we know uh, her profession, Zanimanya, Domac, it's a house, uh, uh, and, and, and she's, she, that she's from, from Belgrade. Um, then we have uh, uh, other information that are really, I think, important. The name, of course, of the victim. In this case, is Nada Georgievich Matkovic. Uh, it's uh, this, uh, uh, yeah. Nada was her uh, daughter was 14 years old. Zanimania is mean profession. This here is written that it means uh, children, child, where she lived in Belgrade and nationality. The nationality is quite interesting from my point of view because it's written Serbian uh, gypsy. I'm quoting Serbian gypsy. Again. If she was then uh, in the number six, uh, if she, the person was uh, a member of the um, the Yugoslav army was were killed or died as a civilian, in this case a civilian, when in 1941, where in the camp, concentration camp of Saimish, and, and, and uh, the way she, she died, in this case she died for anger, for anger. and the, the amount the family should receive as, let, let's say, compensation for, for, the, for this loss. Um, these similar documents are, are uh, for example, I, uh, I have documents for, for Belgrade, but basically there are similar documents also for the other cities. So thanks to these documents, we can have like uh, a lot of information about the, the victims, the names, the professions, where they lived, uh, and of course, some in some cases also what they, uh, about the jobs before, before the, the Second World War. In the case of the archive of Yugoslavia, that is basically the most important archive, if we talk about the history of the 20th century in Serbia and Yugoslavia, we have testimonies collected by the subcommission of the State Commission for Determining Establishing the Crimes of the Occupies and their Collaboration. Daniel mentioned this commission this morning. 
uh, there was a, a, a state commission that uh, had subcommission on republic level and then on, on regional level. And they collected documents, they collected testimonies, and they collected um, and they made produced a lot of records, basically documenting all the crimes committed in Yugoslavia. These are the, the documents, some of two, two kinds of the documents. Uh, on the left, left uh, there is a document from Belgrade, and on the, on, the, on the right side there is a document from another city, from Khrushchev. So basically what we can, we, we can uh, uh, read here. First of all, the, uh, the information about the person who is giving the testimony. So also in this case it's very important because you know that in this case uh, Maria Zivković from born in, is in the village of Bukovica. Uh, Bukovic uh, uh, housewife, Lee, she lived in Belgrade. In, we know exactly uh, in which um, uh, street, in uh, Bodnikova street, number 14, so we can locate exactly the house where she lived. Uh, the nationality is Serbian, and, and in this case, and, uh, um, and uh, Orthodox, uh, Christian Orthodox. Uh, these are the, basically the, 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 the data and information about the person who is giving the, this testimony. Then there is this, the, the short uh, statement, the, the testimony. So she says, for example, she describes exactly what happened. Uh, uh, she says, for example, here that he was, she was deported in December of 41 as gypsy from her house with he, her children, and she, they were deported to the Simonster camp. Where they remained two months and months, and, and then they, they were released. Um, we have to keep in mind that these kind of testimonies are the, the testimonies were collected not for remembrance, not for uh, uh, documenting the, the genocide, but for uh, for the for the war damage. It means for the total amount of money that Yugoslavia should claim from from Germany. So it's different different if we talk about testimonies today or testimonies immediately after the, the war. In the second case, there is a very short, brief sentences about the case of, of Khrushchev, the city where uh, mass shooting took place in September 41, and now we have, here we have only like very briefly uh, uh, sentences. For example, in on September uh, 24, in the morning, the, the German came, they took my, my, my husband, and then he was shot. Now, uh, a little bit in detail, uh, why, why these um, testimonies are, are really important. So let's say, let's do a little, a little um, um, exercise. Uh, this is another testimony from Belgrade. Uh, in this case, Jukar Dosavljevic from Belgrade, for the, for, from a, a, a part of the city called the Italian Mala, street number uh, eight, uh, house number seven. She was, she is 39 years old, housewife. She was um, Christian Orthodox, uh, uh, gypsy, I'm quoting. Um, she testified that on the 28th of October 41 in the morning, at four in the morning, uh, the Serbian police, <laughs> policeman came and uh, uh, arrested uh, uh, some mem male members of her family. Mlada Mirkovic, she was 22 years old, and then uh, um, her wife, her children, and, and so on. Um, so then she describes why, I mean, what, for example, the, the, the policemen told to them, they said that they, they will, uh, they have just to, to say goodbye to his family, to, 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 to the family, because they will never see uh, again the member of the family. So basically they were telling them that they will be deported and, and, and killed. And then they were uh, transferred to a, the local police station and then to the uh, concentration camp Toposki Shupe. Uh, and it was a camp uh, of, 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 um, um, in Belgrade, one of the concentration camps in Belgrade. And then the three days after, the, um, after this, uh, they were deported uh, in another place and still in 1941, they don't know what happened with them. Um, basically is what 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 is is here with then we can use for example other sources coming from other archives or museum and we can have let's say the context for example in this case there is a photo the picture of, of from the 
um, uh, Museum of Belgrade, what in, in, is, is important is in, in this photo is that here you can read the Osmi Red Bray 7, uh, Bray, uh, Bray, um, 7. It means the um, uh, street number 8 and house number 7. This is the house where Yulka lived. So basically, this is a pre war a picture from uh, 1939. So we can see exactly the house, the place from where they were deported. We don't know, of course, if the, the persons of, on, on, on this picture, if they were deported or not. But basically, we have you know, also an, an image, a picture of, of, of that place. And then we can, we can connect also these two documents to another one that is basically another testimony uh, from the neighbor. Of uh, from another woman, woman who lived close to the near to the to Yulka. In this case, is Sveta Stefanovic. She also she confirms that uh, that the family of of Yulka was deported, and then she adds that also her family was deported, and especially her um, uh, um, uh, daughter and her uh, son-in-law with with uh, with uh, with uh, their child. It means. Um, Yaleva Ibishevich, uh, uh, 30 years old, her um, um, daughter, and uh, um, the, the, um, her, her child, Desenka, she was four years old. They were deported to Sanishte. And also in this case, they don't know what happened with them. So basically, if we can, let's say, uh, uh, read these documents on a micro level, I think that is very important to have you know, not only to talk about it, but the numbers, about the number of the, of the victims, but also to reconstruct the local history, the local uh, the local context, and saying that if they were victims, this person, persons who lived in, in Belgrade in this case, they had a house, they had a family, they had a job, and then at one moment they became victims uh, of, of uh, racial persecutions and, and Nazi ideology. Uh, there are also other uh, local, let's say, informal archives. There are not institutional archives. In this case, for example, let's say what is preserved by local Roma and non-Roma communities. There is a really interesting case, is the case of Testanik. Testanik is a small city in, um, in central Serbia. And in, uh, in October of, uh, 1942, um, the do a doctor, uh, Sava Stojanovic, he managed to save a group of uh, I mean, all the, the local Roma population, uh, thir um, 200, 300 uh, uh, persons. Uh, how uh, it happened? Uh, he was a doctor and he just said that there was an epidemic of typhus in, in that city. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so the German, the German troops didn't enter that location and then he managed in this way to save all the village. This is the doctor. Uh, uh, but what, why this story is important is important, of course, from the today point of view, also for the fighting against the, the racism against the Roma. So not only from the historical point of view, but it's important because after the end of the war, the local Roma population uh, they uh, uh, wanted to to uh, not to forget what happened. So basically, they organized a theater play. Uh, dedicated to the doctor to, to, what, to what happened. And in this theater play, they played uh, the victims, they played the perpetrators, and they played also the doctor, in this case, Dr. Salastanovich. Uh, in 1967, uh, in also a, a short documentary film was, uh, was made. Uh, so basically, you know, this is like every year the, the Roma, local Roma population organized, I don't know today, but they organized uh, um, uh, commemorations, they organize like um, uh, um, um, events uh, dedicated to the, to the doctor and to what happened. So basically, this is a kind of living memory, living memory that still today is present at least at local level. So at the end, you know, I don't need this, I, at the end, in the conclusion, the conclusion is that uh, we have uh, hundreds uh, or maybe thousands of testimonies preserved in Yugoslavian and Serbian archives. Uh, we know about testimonies from uh, Belgrade, from Kruševac, Leskovac, Nish, Shabbat, but this, and Kragovac, but basically we have still to research, and this is what Daniel said, we need a team, we need other person interested in researching, in the research. 
These testimonies, as I said, uh, we don't have to consider these testimonies like uh, of like oral history. I mean, the purpose, the aim of the testimonies, of the collecting of the testimony was uh, quite different from the purpose of today uh, uh, testimony, collecting today uh, testimony. The second is that these testimonies are important from a point of view, not only in historiography, but also in education and in remembrance, and something that we can, uh, let's say, use also in the educational system. Uh, we also try to do this. Um, and the third point is that don't believe if uh, some historians claim still that there are no sources on testimony and Roma genocide. Uh, this is uh, not a joke. Uh, some, let's say, two, ten years ago, five years ago, a lot of historians said, usually, you know, we know it's impossible to research about the Roma genocide because there are no sources, because the Roma, uh, Romani people, they don't have like a uh, they don't write and, and so on. No, of course, it was, uh, it's really wrong. But sometimes today you can still hear these kind of statements. And this is really problematic because from my point of view, this is like a, a kind of racism uh, among historians and intellectuals because basically they're not interested in working on, on these topics like, like the Roma, Roma genocide. And this is all for presentation and I really have a lot of questions but I don't want to reduce my role as the chair so I would just invite the audience to, to think and reflect but maybe just uh, to, to praise the lectures because I think Adrian presented an excellent case of oral history and I think what you are doing in Romania is excellent many of, many of us are know that you are doing a very pioneering work in collecting oral uh, histories of survivors and uh, and Joey presented an excellent analysis of written testimonies and, and I think this struggle for recognition and, and compensation from the 60s and 70s is really amazing. I didn't know about this part of history. We can read much more about the 1980s when Romani, the struggle of Romani was and the central right for recognition, but the 60s and 70s history was, was really amazing. And, uh, and what Milovan presented was really a unique combination of written uh, testimonies, but also visual materials, and they are very powerful. And and in your last slide, basically, you connected and opened up the discussion for us, how we can use it, what, what is the current state of affairs, how we can contribute to this struggle, basically, both in science and beyond in society. So I would just invite any comments, reflections, questions from the audience. Please. Yeah. Um, so as a non-historian, but trying to dabble in history, um, I'm interested in the accessibility of these documents. I, I see um, Joey Rauschenberger, you used some stuff from the Bundesarchiv, and I have, you know, tried to get some things and you have to know exactly what you want often, and you have to, you know, there's not much way to sort of just, you know, look through a whole collection of things. And I'm just wondering in, in all the countries how accessible many of these documents are in the archives. Maybe you can respond to it when yeah, you're yeah. thinking, yeah. It just, I, I have to um, make clear, I, I didn't use material from the uh, federal archive now, but from the uh, Baden-Württemberg state uh, archives. I had a photo from the from the Bundesarchiv, oh. so maybe that was um, uh, the reason you thought uh, I used uh, material from the Bundesarchiv. But I agree with you that the accessibility of these documents and the files um, when it uh, comes to compensation and the individual case files is a problem. Um, and that is because all these individual case files are existing in the archives, um, but it's uh, very many of them. So one archive has more than 100,000 uh, individual case files. And if we talk about one file, that's often differs, but that's often paper up to, you know, 10 centimeters or more. Um, and uh, the way they are ordered in the archives is not, um, uh, they are not, um, uh, they, they don't uh, separate um, victim groups. 
Yeah. So if you want to look for um, files uh, from Sinti and Roma, you have to know the specific name of the persecutee and uh, in the best case, the date of birth as well, at least. Then it's quite easy. They can find his file and, or, or hers and, uh, and give it to you. But you cannot come and say, hey, I want to see 100 files from Sinti and Roma. So you have to do a lot of uh, work, a lot of research uh, in advance to, to even get access to these files. Yeah, it's amazing what, what I heard from all of you, I think. Yeah. Please, Nidhi, and then I will collect others. Yeah, let's start with Nidhi and yeah, Daniel, and then I collect. Just yeah. to follow up with Joey. Um, so just, I wanted to understand the chronology a little better. Because my understanding is 1983 is when at the federal level, um, Helmut Schmidt finally says he has a national declaration that in fact, the Roma and Sinti are victims of the genocide, the Holocaust. And so did, did that year make any difference in terms of the trajectory of the compensation? And then secondly, the Zentralrat, the role, if you could explain a bit more about the role of the Zentralrat. Because again, like uh, Martin, 1960s, 70s, I hadn't been aware that there were these individual applications. And I saw you were in the Freiburg archive, you were in that archive and you got that specific uh, documentation. Um, so, so if you could just maybe contextualize for me a little better. And then finally, the last question, which is a legal point, um, was there a kind of statute or is there a statute of limitations? In other words, can the grandchildren or great grandchildren collect compensation. Yeah. Thank you. I would suggest to collect a few more and then I give the floor to each panelist. Please, Daniel. Uh, <clears throat> great presentations for all the presentation. Um, question for Milan, but also colleagues can also give their opinion. Identity of the Roma. Did you have any problem when you research and analyze this document, testimony, in um, obtaining the the real identity of Roma, I have the problem in my experience. Then in some documents, I know that uh, the surname probably is Roma, but they declare themselves as a member of other nationalities, mostly Serbian, some Croatian. Do you have this kind of experience? Also, the colleagues in Transistria probably did, um, did the Roma hide their own identity, not just after the war, but when you try to interview them, they this, they, this um, I would say, strategy of surviving um, about what happened during the, uh, the war and so on. Thank you. One more question in the back. Yeah. Yes, I would be from uh, Milovan Pisari. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very good. Also, because you're talking about informal archive and uh, other ways to perceive the archive also. And my question would be in a sense of um, how difficult it is to validate this sort of photo history and this um, alive archive that, that emerged in local communities into academia. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I would invite you to reflect and just to enlarge on the, the first question of Nidhi Trehan to, to address this, each of you because you mentioned the central right? but I think in each country it's important that with this historical presentation is often, often very individualistic and these individual uh, histories, but there is a movement for recognition in each country and in Germany central right is important, but maybe you could speak a bit about Romania and, and Serbia, Yugoslavia, because in Yugoslavia there was a strong Roman intelligentsia and you know what was their role. So if you could just elaborate on that, and whoever can start, yeah. So um, regarding the identity uh, in the documents of the Roma, what I found in, uh, in general, and it's the fact that uh, define uh, themselves like Orthodox. Uh, they uh, uh, say that, uh, uh, they are born in Romania, they belong uh, to the uh, Romanian people, and uh, it's uh, evident that uh, they want uh, to uh, assess all the eugenic and biopolitic criteria that were designed uh, in that period by the state, uh, like was uh, the orthodox uh, faith. So, it was 
difficult in uh, in general to say that uh, we are not Roma because they were living in uh, in communities. But uh, what it's evident is that they wanted to uh, define themselves through the uh, main uh, uh, factors that were defi defining at that time the Romanian nation. So the only uh, thing that uh, they couldn't uh, say about them, it was like, we are not Romanians of blood. And uh, another uh, way of defining uh, themselves, because also I noticed in your presentation, Milan, uh, you know that there were deported sedentary Roma and uh, all uh, nomads Roma. And in the case uh, of the sedentary that were deported, <clears throat> like uh, five percent of, 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 of the population uh, they say all in general when they make petitions we are not nomads so they want in a way to uh, show that uh, they are assimilated to the romanian uh, uh, society uh, and this is very very uh, evident in the way in, in which they define themselves and I, in, in general, the idea is uh, that they want to show that they are assimilated to the Romanian uh, nation and they, they should not be deported. Okay. Uh, well, we, uh, I agree with you, Daniel. Sometimes we have, uh, I, 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 I um, had the same problem reading the documents. Sometimes you can read, for example, that someone declared himself or herself like um, um, Serb, Serb. And basically, by using other documents, uh, by comparing with other sources, documents, you can see that basically it, it is a Roma. Uh, I mean, in some other cases, it's it's easier because the state commissions decided, in a way, to to, to write now to write immediately that she she or or he is a Roma. Um, I mean, in a way, I understand, of course, the, the, the problem in 1944 and 45 of, of, of Roma. Uh, of sure, uh, many of them, they didn't want to declare themselves as, 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 as Roma. And we have to understand this, of course, because, you know, in 41, 42, 43, they were victims of terrible um, uh, measures of, of genocide. And then in 44, 45, the new authorities arrived, the communists, but basically they didn't know nothing, anything about the communists. So it was like, oh, well, they now, maybe it's better to declare ourselves as Serbs and not as Roma, because already the others killed us, maybe, you know. So, uh, but but, uh, but I, I think that by comparing the different sources, we can basically have this, the uh, 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 you know, conclude that we are talking about Rome. And concerning the um, the uh, the informal archives, well, it's not a, also in this case. I, I don't think it's a problem for the academy. I think that it's a matter of methodology. When you, for for example, if you decide, I, I mean, I, I I work a lot on local history, and, and I think that really by uh, researching and writing about the local context, micro history, we can understand better a different different situation. So, for example, in the case of Tristanic and Visit, you can use different sources. You can start with start with this with this testimony with, with world history, and then you can you can you know uh, 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 use, for example, archival documents, newspapers, and other other different sources. You can you at the end you can use all the different sources. So it's not for me, I don't think it's a problem to, to you know, to bring this kind of, 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 uh, of sources into the academy, into the academy. Um, yeah, you, thank you for the questions. Um, you asked for the chronology. Um, I think uh, chronologically, the early 1980s with the uprising of the um, civil rights movement and the founding of the, um, the Central Council is very important for this history and for, for the uh, for the Roma struggle for um, especially for societal recognition. Um, individually, for the single Sinto or Rom who applied uh, for compensation, it was maybe not the, um, the crucial point because the, um, the, the the legal basis is the Federal uh, Compensation Act, um, 1956, 
respectively 1956, uh, uh, respectively 1953. Um, and um, this act uh, didn't exclude uh, Roma generally. Um, so it formulated um, uh, a compensation was paid to everyone who was um, persecuted, persecuted um, politically, racially, or religiously. And um, what was contested now by the officers and by the judges for a long time was that Roma were um, persecuted uh, by the reasons of, of race. Yeah? They said anti ziganists of course, they were criminal, they were um, a problem, they didn't behave properly. Asocial. Uh, so, they, so they came to, uh, to concentration camps, but that was not necessarily due to uh, racial policy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so that, that's, what the, that's what the officials uh, claimed uh, often. And um, there was a, um, a judgment in uh, 1956 from the um, uh, BGH, German uh, federal, uh, highest federal court, um, that stated this basically. And in 1963, this was, uh, this was taken back. So this, this uh, matter of time, beginning of 1960s, and then the, um, the uh, compensation and <coughs> final act in 1966 was maybe more important for uh, for the individual compensation for Sinti and, and Roma to get their payments and, and to be successful here. Um, and uh, the limitation for compensation to, uh, to the first generation, this was a legal question basically, and legally I think I can answer it quickly, uh, there uh, is no chance to get uh, compensation for the um, second or third generations by now. Um, there are discussions because now that uh, not many actual Holocaust survivors um, are still alive, that um, survivors of the second and third generation say we are damaged too in, in a way. Yeah? We um, um, inherited this, uh, these traumata, but uh, by law right now, they have no chance to, uh, to get pain. I suggest to have a second round. Agnes and Ari already indicated, and, and also other people, but please, Agnes. Do you mean that without the civil rights movement of Central Rat and other organizations, uh, the federal court decision will be the same in 63, 66? Without the, uh, civil without rights the movement? pressure of <clears throat> civil rights movement. Yeah, well, in the 1960s in Germany, the civil rights, the Roma civil rights movement was not so um, important. This only started in the in the 1970s. Oh no, uh, much more earlier. When when would you <laughs> say it started? Uh, when am I right? They made the first ever demonstration in 57. Where? In Germany? Yes. As, as far as the, the first uh, demonstration um, that I'm aware of was uh, in Heidelberg, actually, in the, in the 1970s. No. And uh, then the Verband uh, Deutscher Sinti was founded by Romani Rose. No. Which later became the... By his uh, yes, um, uncle. Uh, by, by the Rose family, yeah. By Vincent it's and Oscar the Rose. They were one generation of, earlier. The Roses were already uh, earlier than the 1980s and, and, and early 1970s they were involved in the in the global roma movement that's right but i would say in in the in the german domestic uh, politics the self-representation of roma in uh, before 1970 was not strong enough to have influence on uh, uh, on, on political decision making i would argue but it, 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 tell me more about this about this demonstration because I'm. Yeah. I wanted to make a comment on uh, this question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so from the first session, we, we had a bit of the, the question of the promise of testimony. 
so so the, my question is is for, for Milovan and Joey because because they both deal with with these bureaucratic sources and I guess I'm curious about so so I guess there are two promises one is agency and voice um, and the other is to find hidden stories is that um, and I'm, I'm wondering if we usually when we dig deeper <laughs> It turns out to be more complicated than that, what these testimonies actually offer. So I wonder if you could reflect on that in the case of the agency question, right? It's, it's niches of agency, basically, in the compensation files. And what agency means can contradict the hidden stories part. So I'm thinking of my own grandparents' compensation files, where I think their agency consists in lying about what happened to them, because you want to optimize, because it's a purposeful act of trying to maximize compensation from people you hate, um, <laughs> um, rather than, right, it's not. <laughs> so um, agency in that sense is not necessarily the thing that we historians want, uh, or, or right? So, so how do you feel about, how is that, rather than, so there's, you just demonstrated that expressions of, uh, of anger are, are agency rather than strategic, which they might be. Um, but how about these other aspects? And then when it comes to the to the to the hidden stories, I guess it's more about these types of state commission files, for example, which we have in the Soviet Union as well, um, have their own pressures, their own logics. So I'm, I'm I'm wondering how you how you deal with those collectively. If you can tell us more about the pressures, perhaps, and the, if you want the bias, the systematic biases that you would find in these files, um, since as you said, uh, some of the state commission files are not even about the individuals. They don't care about the individuals. They want to maximize the documentation of damage. In this case, so if, you want, if they're lying. They're lying to the outside world, to the Germans, <laughs> about about how much damage was done. So how does that how is that reflected in individual interviews that ultimately come out of this? Let's see if there are other questions or comments we can still collect, and then I give you back the floor. Better, please. Um, so for uh, Milovan, um, these documents created after uh, the war, um, were they used by the um, authorities in Yugoslavia uh, in these uh, negotiations with uh, West Germany in some respects, or did they consider doing this? Other questions, comments? Please, Mike. Just a co well, comment for Adrian. I mean, it was a lovely paper. And, um, um, you, you talked at the end about um, the use of these foreign terms, the sort of mnemonics, the other than the chleb and uh, um, some non-Romanian, non-Romani words. Yeah? Um, and I just was really more for an observation comment for you. There's a very famous bit in Shoah, the Claude Lanceman film, where, and it disconnects with some of the conversations this morning, where um, Lanceman has got Abraham Bomba. Um, to describe what it was like being a barber um, in the camp where he shaved the heads of people. Um, and they get to a point where he has to describe what happened when people from his own town, um, Chesrova, um, appeared. Um, and he breaks down Bomba. Um, he can't carry on talking. And, and Lanceman forces him to, effectively. I mean, he begs him to. He says that this is what we agree we're going to do. Um, but when Bomba then finally starts to speak again, he's speaking in German. Um, so he, up to then they're speaking in English. Um, <clears throat> and he, I mean, he starts to remember, he, he, he talks as if he were in the camp again um, for about 30, 40 seconds before coming back into the present, as it were. But it's, I mean, it's something that I think lots of people who've collected testimony, if you get them, people talked about, you, know, you have individuals like Otto Rosenberg, who's quite detached in his, in his telling, maybe related to the person he's talking to. You have other people in people in testimonies who are very passionate. Um, and Bombo's clear. I mean, Lanceman is always seeking for that in a way, or to find something to get to put people back in that moment. But I was I was just struck by your, your observation and thought it was rich and worth pursuing further. But it was very nice to hear somebody still collecting these testimonies and taking them seriously. Um, thank you.
any final comments, questions, or then I would invite the panelists, please respond to the <coughs> questions. Whoever can start, yeah. Okay, well, so that's it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you can uh, exactly you can read uh, when you read the documents. You can let's say divide the documents in some two at least two parts. The first one is the is the testimony is what the person is saying about what happened, and I think that this is true. This is really happened. For example, when she or he says, "Okay, my name is," and my husband was taken and killed, and so on. This is okay. Then you have another part, usually at the end of the document, when you exactly can read, let's say, the same exactly the same sentences in every uh, uh, every document. So, so, for example, if you, if you have 800 documents for Belgrade, at least in 790 you can read the same sentence. <laughs> and this is exactly what the state commission wanted to be present in in, in the in the in the doc document, and this is what is. What, what what is then uh, you know they used for, for for the total amount they have to claim from from Germany, and these sentences you can read. Uh, that is is part of the testimony. So let's say that the person, the same person who is giving the testimony at the end says, "Yes, I know that uh, uh, Milan Nedić, the general of the, the Serbian authorities, are guilty. The, the, the command, the German commandant of the city, they're guilty, and so on." Basically, I, I don't think they really knew who was the, you know, the, 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 the in, in, I mean, at the head of German authorities. And then you can read like, for this, they claim I want, I don't know, five thousand dinners for my, for, for what happened to me. So this is exactly what the, the commission wants to be, you know, wants to write. So yes, you're perfectly right. There is like a part that is a spontaneous one and another part that is exactly, you know, uh, it's, it's part of the pressure on the, the Yugoslavia should do on, 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 on Germany. And also this is connected to what you, you asked. I don't know if they, they, uh, uh, how they use this, this, uh, these documents, but they think that uh, at the end, I mean, of the work of the state commissions, at the end they calculated the total amount of the victims. And then they say to Germany, okay, now I have to pay for the old victims. And they probably they made some different agreements on a political and diplomatic level. I don't know what happened at the end, but I'm sure that nobody received, or the victims, nobody received any kind of, of, of compensation. Oh, 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 oh. No, I'm not right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can argue, yes. Exactly what you mentioned in the morning was uh, at the head of uh, some reparation commission from the beginning of 1980s. But this is not a thing. This is uh, another story. Yes, but the the question negotiation between Yugoslavia and Germany, Slobodan Jovanovic published a book several years ago in a Serbian historian published in Croatia. And he didn't mention I I, I analyzed his work and asked him he didn't find any document that Yugoslav diplomacy introduced uh, about the Roma suffering, the numbers, the damage, and so on. But I agree with you that the total number, not just uh, several years after the war, this was the process negotiation between Yugoslav and Germany that lasted 20 years. 20 years negotiation between Yugoslav and German diplomacy about uh, war damage, reparation damages, yes. And uh, one special process is the process of reparation of the Roma victims. Why they received some in Serbia, why didn't they receive in Slovenia, in Croatia? What was the uh, part of, of, for example, some Roma uh, get reparation in the 1990s that were on the occupied uh, Hungarian uh, territory of Međimurje and Baranja, because they were uh, under the Nazi, and uh, in comparison uh, to the other. The agenda was they received compensation, Roma as other victims, 
of the victims of fascist terror in Yugoslavia. Yeah, but I, I don't know who, 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 I mean, they received from... They were not in vigil. No, no, no. This was a special fund, uh, Atskovic, uh, no, but, but he, he didn't written about... Uh, no, this is a fund, I think, of forced laborers. And then they, they did the Roma. Some Roma received, but not because they were because of the racial persecution, not because of the genocide, but because they were, you know, uh, prisoner of power, prisoner of war. That happened only in 1999. Okay. Before, in 80s, before the compensation, we must research more about this, especially the, the question of reparation to the Roma. Is these uh, Roma victims all the same in the context of, for example, Yugoslavia? Why some Roma victims received reparation, why some but they didn't yeah. receive because they were victims of the genocide of the racial persecution. They would. I'm not sure, Milan. I must. I'm not sure. I would suggest that let's invite Adi yes. and Joey, and then in the coffee break we continue this. But please, if you want to respond to any of the points that came out in the last um, round by Ari and others, if you want. I would like to thank you for the, for the comment to the Professor Michael Stewart. And also, I I, uh, I was remembering that sometimes they also uh, recall in their uh, memory uh, the words uh, of the soldiers that were uh, putting them to uh, work, and uh, they were uh, watching them. So it's uh, but I mean the main problem for this paper, I think it's uh, the limited, I would say, uh, number of uh, interviews in uh, which I uh, found uh, such, type, such a type of uh, mnemonics, let's say. But uh, if I will find also in other interviews, I think it's worth to, to write a paper about this. Yeah. Joey, final comments, reflections? <coughs> yeah. Um, thank you for the uh, comment, if I remember correctly it was it was about the yeah the relationship of agency and hidden stories and mm -hmm. the sometimes contradictory um, um, relationship and of course my examples here now my sources are more about the matter of agency than these stories it was more about trying to um personally uh, um, influence this individual proceeding um although i um want to add that these files um, contain the the stories the, the personal stories of um, of uh, persecution as well it's just not what i what i presented here but um because there are also uh, situations of uh, interrogations uh, of the, um, the the applicant the former um, persecuted applicant who told then his whole story of, uh, of persecution um, during the Second World War. And um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to add one more thought, of course, is that agency can uh, be contradictory to, uh, to, the, to the hidden stories. For example, if Sinti and Roma lied on their identity towards the uh, compensation offices, this can lead to the fact that we don't get to know the, uh, the sources, we don't get to know the files. So when we uh, are looking for uh, compensation files of Sinti and Roma, and uh, nobody even in the administration knew um, this was, uh, this was uh, a Roma a Holocaust survivor, um, then I won't know it when I search for the, for the compensation. Thank you. I suggest that at this point we continue in the coffee break, but I would like to thank the three excellent panelists and for the even better questions. Thank you.